Hi, my name is Arius, and today I'm going to give you a summarized rundown of all the things you'll need to adventure with into the abyss. Why is this important? In many of my videos, I mentioned that you can farm the abyss for gold chests, experience, gold, and materials. I've provided some information in my previous videos on how to deal with some of the monsters you may encounter in the abyss. The difference here is that I will be bringing all that information together in one comprehensive and summarized video of only the most essential things you'll need to successfully run the abyss. So here's the most important thing to understand, monster scaling and level 100, otherwise known as the deep abyss. Oh, and spoiler alert, if you haven't heard, which I'm sure none of you haven't, but just in case, there's actually an end to the abyss. Yup, that's right. Sorry friends, it's not endless. It stops at 150. As soon as you set foot on floor 150, you get kicked out. Cool, but how do we get that high? And what level can I do the abyss? Well, the answers are practice and whatever level. If you start at low levels, you'll probably be able to clear through the first few floors or more. And that's great. You'll eventually get to a point where gear will make a difference. And here's why. Monster scale, the higher up you go. So basically what Deep Abyss is, is 15 levels above your recommended floor. For example, my recommended floor is 67. So that means for me, Deep Abyss doesn't start until 82. So if I start at level 83, that means I'm already in Deep Abyss. But regardless of your level, there will always be Regular Abyss and Deep Abyss. Again, deep means monsters are level 100. And that's important because once you learn how to deal with monsters in the deep abyss or level 100, that means you've pretty much mastered it and can walk yourself up to 150. Okay, so with that said, do you have to only farm deep abyss to make it worth it? Of course not. But to make this easy, once you understand how Deep Abyss works and what it takes to get there, your journey through the lower levels will be much easier. You'll see what I mean. Let's start with equipment. In early stages of the game, you can get by with the gear that you find on quests and such, as long as you know how to optimize usage with them. Once you hit later stages of the game, you'll note that crafting your own gear and enchanting them with max level enchants is better than the gear you find on quests. Always remember that damage is the most important thing, more important than mitigation, because the faster you can kill things, the less you need to mitigate. So let's talk about the most common weapon types you'll need in the Abyss by order. The first one's Fire Slashing, Frost Slashing, Shock Bashing, and Stamina Cleaving. Now the secondaries are like icing on the cake. You don't really need them, but if you're going to get some, the best ones to have are Minus Max Magicka and Minus Max Stamina. Others that are really good for weapons or shields are plus 15% primary enchants and increased elemental effectiveness. So that's the easy part for weapons. And I know I said damage is the most important, but it won't matter if you die too fast. So here's the armor and jewelry you will need for the Abyss. What I'll say here is that if you're not max level 45, by the way, to use endgame gear and 50 to have all skill points, I wouldn't craft any gear unless you get stuck and can't farm any more gold chests. Even at higher levels, it should be enough to grind up to gold chests, quit the town, and repair. That should be a good enough grind until you can get the gear you need for Deep Abyss. But once you've decided you're ready to get into Deep Abyss, then by all means, craft away. Ideally, here's what you'll need to deal with all the monsters in the Deep Abyss. You'll need three types of helmets, health, shock, and fire. Two types of chests, health, and poison, and five types of boots. And why all the boots? Well, it's because they're cheaper to make. Secondaries will help again and make the runs easier, but they aren't necessarily required. The best ones to have are combinations of slashing, bashing, and cleaving resistance. 
After that, I think increased physical and elemental resistances at crit health are pretty good too. Then you also got spell resistance, which is good. So, you know, don't spend too much time trying to collect all the right pieces. Just find out what works good enough for you to get you into a good farming pattern. If you're teetering on plate versus light armor, well, light armor is nice because of the built-in elemental resistances. If you're going light armor, Daedric's scale is pretty good for dealing with all the fire and stuff that you end up with in the abyss. But for me, I prefer plate. That's just because I don't want to have to make any more gear. Now, does it have to be three helmets, two chests, and five boots? No. I have a different combination of both, but ideally, you want to try to get those numbers. Now, if you're going to enchant your own pieces, don't waste endgame material like grand soul gems on anything less than a level 10 enchantment. If you're low level, it's okay to enchant up to the elevated because those are pretty easy to get. But don't use up your grand soul gems. Grand soul gems are by far the most used soul gems when you're at the later stages of the game. So save those. Another garbage enchant. Yay! Thank you, my enchanter who's not even Severio. Well, let's see if we could get one right. Highly doubt it, but we'll find out. In any case, let's go see what Severio's got going on. What did you have in mind? Only the finest quality. No soul gems, but I'll take some materials. By the way, these materials, oh my goodness. They are very, very important. Make sure you're always shopping your own enchanters for the materials because you could always go back and get your gold by selling stuff that you don't need, right? So... If you're running low on gold, buy stuff from your own town so you could sell stuff back to it. If you're not doing it already, make sure you're doing town runs in your guild. See, for example, in the Illuminati, we like to notify each other who has grand soul gems or not. The reason why is because if you get the timing right, see these were posted three hours ago, someone mentioned that I had one grand soul gem in my town and they were right. The instances of your guildmates' towns will reset, and the reset happens usually every 12 hours. Now remember, each instance is personalized to your character. So if I go in and grab one soul gem from my town, that soul gem will be there for everybody in my guild as long as they go grab it before the town resets. And when does the town reset? Like I said, every 10 to 12 hours, it depends on who was the last person that touched your town. That has something to do with the timer. I'm not entirely sure. If someone else out there is, we would all like to know. So let us know in the comments below. Now for jewelry and gloves. What I recommend for any type of PVE is to use health regen. Why health regen? Because, well, it makes you stay alive longer. And you don't really have to worry about magic or stamina regen for the most part, as long as you manage your skills effectively. If you like being more of a warrior than a mage or vice versa, pick stamina or magic as appropriate. The most important item here is your necklace. Not for the regen, but for the skills and their potential damage and defensive bonuses. My favorite to use is enchantment synergy an armsman or scout or barbarian whichever matches your weapon type matching set is nice for defensive bonus or anything else that increases elemental damage or defense for secondaries go for the ones that give you the best offensive power physical damage ignores armor or pdia it's probably among the most helpful anything else increasing damage elemental or physical is good too now, as far as gameplay and strategy, you'll basically need five loadouts, all focused on very specific enemies. Note, there are no dragons in Deep Abyss, which is why it's much better to farm. Dragons are hard, man, but I'll do my best to give you some tips on those. But the point of these loadouts are to mitigate monster damage and maximize yours. All of these loadouts will use the same magic skills, absorb, ward, and resist elements. All level 1 until you get to endgame level 45 to 50, then use what makes up for what you lack in armor. 
So basically, there are only three spells you'll need in the Abyss. For offensive strategies, remember to use weapons that focus both on their physical and elemental weaknesses. Okay, so let's talk about the Lich and the Storm Atro loadout. So for the abilities, you could pretty much use whatever strikes you want or uh, piercing damage. If you're using elemental weapons, you use piercing strikes and dodge. So for armor, you'll want two shock and one poison. Defensive strategy against a Lich. Use resist elements if your gear doesn't mitigate enough damage. Save the ward for the delayed lightning bolt or blind. Now for the offensive strategy, fire slashing weapons is your friend. Hold your weapon up so that they do a high block. When it drops to low block, unleash your damage. And you can trick them by interrupting their own spell casting by holding a manual swing and getting them to high block. Oh. From there, you can attack cancel or wait till it drops and swing through the low block. For storm matronox, hold your weapon up to trick them into a high block too and release when they low block. Watch out for the high block resets too on all monsters. Now let's go to nether liches. The abilities are the same, pretty much. You fight them like a lich, except they're not a lich, right? So you use a little more poison and a little less shock. Two poison, one shock. Now for the Dramoras and the Flame Atronox. The abilities are pretty much the same. Recovery strikes, piercing strikes, and any dodges you want. You want one health and two fire. The defensive strategy is pretty similar. The highest damage spell is usually Fireball, so you could block it with a Ward or Absorb. If it's a Warlock Dramora, they'll use a Delayed Lightning Bolt. If you see it cast, you could time a Ward or an Absorb to eat it. Now use Resist Elements if their fire damage is too strong for you. For offensive strategy, Frost or Slashing or both is great. Frost Cleaving is better for Atronox if you're having trouble with them. Block the initial attack. Then cast Resist Elements so that you can unleash your offensive. Hold that swing up to bait the high block. Then after the initial attacks while having Ward and Absorb ready. Then attack when the block drops. Now for skeletons, the abilities you'll want are recovery strikes, piercing strikes, staggering bash, or any of the dodges that are appropriate. Again, these builds are not for like very specific. For me, I'm a two-hander. I go into the abyss as a two-hander. It's not going to be the same for me as it is for you if you're a versatile or a mage. So again, use what's appropriate. Now for skeletons, on the armor, you're going to want three times health and a shock shield if you're using versatile. Why a shock shield? So when you block them, they take shock damage, which you're weak to. Or when you execute a bash, they take shock damage, which they're weak to, right? Cool. So what's the defensive strategy? Basically, when they unleash their first hit, boom, block it. Keep up the attacks while they are stunned, right? Bam, bam, bam. Make sure you get those crits. Use a staggering bash if you're versatile to stun them again. The idea is to prevent them from doing damage. If you're not using a shield and you're like me, a two-hander, use those dodges. Renewing dodge is beautiful because it gives you magicka enough to get you another ward. So before they execute that big attack like Guard Breaker or Skull Crusher, cast a ward, right? That'll take some of that damage away. Then use a dodge to dodge their next attack. And then a dodge like Renewing Dodge will give you mana back. And then if you use Focusing Dodge, that decreases your skill time. Timer, so you could go right back to using ward again. It's a great tactic for not just two-handers. If you want to try it as versatile or a mage, try it too. It's pretty good. But if you are using shields, Harrying Bash is another good one because it prevents them from using their skills. Now, when they use Staggering Bash or Harrying Bash, you could use Absorb to eat that timer reset from Harrying and the stun from Staggering. Most people don't know that. Now, for the offensive strategy, use a Shock Bashing Weapon. Go big on crits or go home. After you get the first stun, kill them before they kill you while mitigating the damage like we talked about. Now for War Masters and Trolls, you're going to again use a similar strategy that you used on the skeletons, right? Kill them before they kill you. So you'll want three times health armor and a stamina drain shield if you use a shield. Okay, now for the defensive strategy, a best defense is a good offense. 
don't turtle up, okay? Drain their stamina, mitigate their damage by high block stun, bash, or dodges. On the offensive strategy, drain their stamina with stamina draining weapons and shield. Fire bashing for trolls if you're having trouble, and if you drain their stamina, they can't hurt you as much. Now what about for non-deep abyss, like regular abyss, right? Well, you still have to deal with Wisp Mothers, Wisps, Frost Atros, and you know, we only have five loadouts, so we can't have loadouts for everything, so you may have to manually switch between some, right? Now, if you're dealing with Wisp Mothers, Wisps, and Frost Atronox, you could basically use the same abilities as like all the other monsters, right? Uh, the armor, two times health, uh, one times frost. And then play with that. If you can't beat them with one times frost, go two times frost. Now the defensive strategies don't get cold, right? Wear your frost resist gear. Use resist elements if needed. Absorb and ward will block that ice spike. Dodge for frostbite. And for the offensive strategy, burn them. Get your fire sword out and just launch them strikes after you land a manual swing for maximized combo damage. Finally, for dragons. The abilities you'll need are three dodges. They're really the best. You could harrying bash them and that may help, but I don't use bashes so much. So let me know if that works for you guys that do. Now for the defensive strategy, you'll note that they're going to do something like a yell and then fly up into the air, right? So cast resist elements first. Switch to a light shield. So as soon as that dragon flies up, pause the game, go into your loadouts or whatever, and then switch to a light shield even if you're a two-hander now why do we do this because for example if they're gonna blow fire on you and you've got a light shield up it has a 751 block rating against fire damage I mean I don't care I'm not a shield user but when the dragons in the air blowing fire down at me I'm gonna put this up and just sit there and wait for him to come down. I mean, y'all play Skyrim, right? What does the Dragonborn do? Boom! Shield that fire breath, run in there, and then charge that dragon, right? Boom. So use them light shields. They're actually pretty good. Then when they come down, you may have a ward up. If you use a renewing dodge with a focusing dodge, you could get that resist elements back and then use that again. Okay, so play with it. Now... Before they land, make sure you take the shield off and switch back to your most offensive setup. It's a DPS race, so do the most damage while they're on the ground. So there you have it, friends. Everything you need to deal with the monsters in the abyss. Stay tuned for an updating enchanting guide focused on endgame enchanting. My name is Arius, and I play games. Cheers, friends.